Hello everyone, welcome to the SAM Narrated Lecture Series. My name is Joe Minardi and I'm the Emergency Ultrasound Director at West Virginia University and today we're going to talk about the biliary tract, mostly the gallbladder. And our objectives, we're going to go over your indications, technique, how you do this, some of the normal anatomy and landmarks that you need to look for, and then we're going to jump right into the pathology. And lastly, we'll hit you with some pearls, pitfalls, and algorithm that we hope you find useful. Always important to know why we care about a topic, why are we talking about it, and um, I think if you work in an emergency department like me, you probably see some patients with abdominal pain, and it's pretty common. Biliary pathology is also one of the most common causes of abdominal pain in the ER, and uh, even more frequently, it's on our differential even when it's not present. The diagnosis usually requires imaging. Uh, we don't usually make this diagnosis solely based on history and physical findings alone. But luckily, with a little bit of practice, a little bit of training, emergency ultrasound at the bedside is pretty quick and accurate, two of my favorite words. And we can actually decrease the length of stay, get patients' treatment a little bit quicker by doing this at the bedside ourselves. And that usually makes my chair, my medical director, hospital administrators, makes them all happy. Reasons you would do a gallbladder ultrasound, abdominal pain, this is by far going to be the most common reason, but sometimes patients may present solely with vomiting or primarily with vomiting. Maybe they have a fever and you don't have a good explanation, especially maybe the patients who have neurologic dysfunction like dementia, aphasia, or some other reason they just don't communicate that well. A patient that's jaundiced without a good explanation, you can quickly, again, rule in or out a diagnosis and do a more focused workup. Or you've gotten some labs back, they're abnormal, their bilirubin's elevated, their transaminases are up, and you want to investigate that a little bit further. Another good reason to do it ultrasound of the gallbladder and try to, again, rule in or out something, focus your differential and your work up a little bit more. So you got to start by uh, choosing the, the right probe to begin with, and you're usually going to use something in the lower frequency range, something around 2 to 5 megahertz, the curved or the phased array probe. You might just call it your abdominal probe. Important point, look for that cholecystectomy scar or ask the patient, have you had your gallbladder out? Kind of embarrassing, spend 10 minutes struggling, never find their gallbladder, and then they say, oh, I don't have that, doc. You could claim you were just looking for the common bile duct anyway. That's kind of weak cover though. The way I usually start once I've got the right probe, I've got my machine on the right setting, my abdominal or my gallbladder setting, patient supine, and start with a subcostal sagittal technique. And uh, that's his midclavicular line on the right under the costal margin with the indicator towards the patient's head. And this view can greatly be assisted by a deep breath. Once you find the gallbladder, then you can get long and short axis views and identify some of the other landmarks. Say that view doesn't work that well, sometimes the gallbladder is a little higher than expected, so you just move up above the costal margin and try to image it in between the ribs. Again, deep breaths may help. Once you identify it, again, go for some long and short axis views of the gallbladder. Make sure you see the other landmarks that are there. Even still, some patients still may be difficult, so then you can try coming out laterally to get some coronal views. Now from here, you're shooting your ultrasound beam through the liver and using it as an acoustic window, and that can be helpful, and you're also getting away from some of the bowel gas. Again, deep breaths may assist you. Make sure you fan anteriorly because the gallbladder sits anterior to the kidney. Sometimes, no matter what you do, it's going to seem like you just can't find the gallbladder. It seems like it's difficult, so there's a few other things that you can do that might help you out. The first one, I always find that a deep inhale by the patient greatly assists. Um, however, if they're having a lot of pain, sometimes that limits that technique. You can turn the patient onto their left side, or you can get them in some inverse Trendelenburg. Both of these things just help move the gallbladder out from under the rib cage a little bit. You can also be a little bit creative with your oblique views and just try um, some different views from different angles above or below the ribs. Some would even suggest just start in the left lateral decubitus position because you know it's always going to be easier. That's probably valid. A couple of things, things you need to notice about the normal sonographic anatomy and what it looks like. I'm going to go ahead and stick arrows up. It's important to make sure when you examine the gallbladder with ultrasound, you examine the whole thing. If you miss a part of it, you might miss the focal part that had the stone in it or the other pathology. So always make sure you see the entire fundus body all the way down to the neck of the gallbladder. Look for your other landmarks. So the gallbladder should sit kind of in the middle of the liver and the main lobar fissure should be nearby and lead you to the portal vein. And if you can find portal vein, then you should be able to find common bile duct. We'll get to that. A few more images of your landmarks. Here's a transverse view or a short axis view. We see the gallbladder, main lobar fissure, portal vein right down here. This is similar, just shown in a clip form. Gallbladder, portal vein pops into view. And here in some long axis views, we see long gallbladder in the portal vein right next to the liver. And in this clip, again, we see a long axis view of the gallbladder. We can see main lobar fissure pop in and portal vein right down here, making the point of our exclamation point. And pattern recognition in ultrasound is important, and the gallbladder, as I've already mentioned, has been compared to an exclamation point. 
with the gallbladder being the long portion and the portal vein being the point. If you can find the portal vein, later on you'll be able to find the common bile duct. A couple of normal variants I just want to point out because you will definitely see these because our patients don't come in fasting. These are some contracted gallbladders. Here you see this very thin gallbladder with an inner halo. That's typical when it's contracted, but you see the liver around and you see the portal vein here helping you confirm that yes, you are looking at gallbladder. And here again, we've got a little tiny contracted gallbladder, inner halo, and uh, portal veins right down here. And here we see a little clip of one that again is contracted, but we see portal vein, we're in the right spot in liver so that we can confirm that this is the right structure. And I'll just point out these um, edge artifact shadows. These should be differentiated from stones because they stay on the edges they don't have stones present and no matter where you go they always follow the edge of the structure a few labels there to kind of help you out a couple other normal variants so you'll often see folds in the gallbladder these are usually echogenic and a little more curved or linear but they shouldn't cast any shadows so here we've got one here there's a couple sitting here in this gallbladder. Those are just normal findings, um, but make sure you scan all the way through them because sometimes they'll give you a false edge for the gallbladder and then you miss a part of it. So the signs of cholecystitis, the pathology now that we're into, we want to look for gallstones or sludge, the sonographic Murphy sign, so that's tenderness right at the gallbladder, and usually you need to compare that tenderness to the rest of the abdomen. Gallbladder wall thickening and fluid around the gallbladder. These are all the pathologic findings you want to look for. And you might ask yourself, okay, so I'm going to do this ultrasound, am I really going to be good enough? Am I going to be accurate at doing this? Can I diagnose the things I'm looking for? So in this table here, this just shows the accuracy of emergency physicians for diagnosing cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. And you see these numbers here in the 80s to 90 percent uh, sensitivity ranges for, and positive predictive values. And for cholecystitis, pretty sensitive, pretty specific, uh, very good negative predictive value, uh, positive predictive not as great. Uh, but all of these numbers are actually very comparable to our radiology colleagues. Remember, even in the radiology lab with the best radiologists and sonographers in the world, sometimes even a great ultrasound can miss biliary tract disease or gallbladder dysfunction. Back into the pathology, just wanted to show you some more examples. I think the more you see, the better. So here are a few examples of uh, hopefully pretty obvious stones in the neck and body of this gallbladder with acoustic shadows. And this is a long axis view. And here's a short axis view of this gallbladder. And again, you've got stones in the dependent area and shadows. Notice how you don't have the smooth curve of the gallbladder anymore. You have something interrupting it. And these little clips here, again, you see stones down towards the neck. You can see the acoustic shadows. And in this view, we've got a big stone more towards the fundus, and you can see the acoustic shadow and a few labels. A couple more examples. Again, the more you see, the better. These are more subtle right here in this gallbladder. They just interrupt that smooth curve you would expect and we see subtle shadows down towards the neck. Uh, these again are not quite as obvious but you don't see the nice smooth curve and then you see the subtle shadows coming down and here in this gallbladder again we see stones and shadows coming down after we've taken a full view. A couple of important signs, look for the stone and neck sign. So that is stones right in the neck of the gallbladder. Very important to check out the neck. Neck stones tend to cause more symptoms and are more likely to cause cholecystitis but they're also easily missed. Here are a couple with an acoustic shadow don't miss those. This one is way low down in the neck. If you didn't get all the way down there, you would miss it, but there's the shadow. And here's another one where this gallbladder kind of curves down. You see this stone down at the neck and a shadow here. Easily could have been missed. And this one here almost was missed until you got right down at the neck and then you see that stone sitting there. Again, more likely to be symptomatic, more likely to cause problems, but easily missed. So be careful. Look at the neck. And there's some leaf. Another sign to look for is the west sign or the wall echo shadow sign. Sometimes the gallbladder is so full of pathology that it's hard to even identify it or recognize that it is a gallbladder. So what you see here, you see roughly the outline of the wall. You see these echogenic things, which are stones and these dark black shadows behind. Now using other landmarks by noticing where you are in the liver. And then like this example here, hopefully see portal vein helps you identify that yes, indeed you are looking at gallbladder and it is yes, indeed full of stones some more pathology to look at. This is some sludge in the gallbladder, so hopefully you see this. Sludge tends to be not quite as echogenic as stones, doesn't generally cast acoustic shadows, and it's usually in the more dependent areas. So here's some sludge layering out in this gallbladder. Here is a little bit here, and in this gallbladder down here we see some sludge. There's also some stones within the sludge with some shadows, and here again we see sludge layering out in this gallbladder as well.
Then on to some of the more specific findings in cholecystitis, we see gallbladder wall thickening. So here as you scan more towards the neck in this gallbladder, you can see thickening around this wall. It just, and it loses its bright white distinction. And this one is all along the anterior portion of this wall where you see thickening. You also see some stones in this gallbladder. You always want to measure it anteriorly because bowel gas and enhancement can interfere with the borders of the wall posteriorly. So don't measure it towards the back. Always measure it anteriorly. And a measurement of a three to four millimeters is considered abnormal although in cases of cholecystitis it tends to be even closer to 5 or 6 millimeters usually. A couple cases here of acalculus cholecystitis, but you see that thickened, indistinct edematous gallbladder wall right there. A couple more examples. These are walls that actually have fluid and edema within the wall, so they almost look like double stripes. And this is another way you might see gallbladder wall thickening. And here we even see a little bit of pericholecystic fluid. And then pericholecystic fluid is another thing that you will look for. And here we see a gallbladder that's wrapped in fluid all around outside of the gallbladder wall. And here we see a little bit layering along this gallbladder wall as well. Again, other findings of cholecystitis. So now, a lot of people have some trouble when they go to look at the common bile duct. And uh, I'm going to go over the way I approach it to hopefully make it a little bit easier for you. Remember, we talked about the gallbladder and the portal vein make up kind of an exclamation point, and that point down at the bottom is the portal vein. So pay attention to that. If you can find that, you'll be able to find the common bile duct. And usually it's sitting right above. It runs in the portal triad with the common bile duct and the hepatic artery. Once I find that, I'll usually rotate counterclockwise and try and identify it in more of a long axis orientation. And then you should be able to see the common bile duct coursing usually right over top of the portal vein. And you can use color to confirm the common bile duct shouldn't have any color in it because its velocity is incredibly low. And you want to measure the most medial portion and uh, at its widest point. You measure from inner wall to inner wall. And measurements, the number to remember is about 5 or 6 millimeters. There are caveats. The common bile duct gets more dilated as you get older, and it can get more dilated after you've had a cholecystectomy. Usually you can add a millimeter per decade of life uh, to that measurement. But just kind of remember 5 or 6 is roughly the normal number. So here's some pathology. This is kind of a uh, double barrel sign. Here's another one that's uh, dilated. A good rule is if it's as big or bigger than the portal vein, it's probably abnormal. So again, I wanted to go over a few Pearl's pitfalls. Again, I think one of the most useful techniques, non-scientific opinion, is to use respiration to help you get good views of the gallbladder. Make sure you're looking for your other sonographic landmarks, your portal vein, your main lobar fissure. Make sure you see some of the hepatic parenchyma nearby to help you not be fooled by other structures like vessels or bowel loops that are filled with fluid. Always be systematic in your evaluation. Make sure you see the body, uh, the fundus, the body, and the neck of the gallbladder. Make sure you look at that neck. Pathology hides there. And then lastly, like with all imaging, all ultrasound, you want to interpret your findings in the wider clinical context. Remember, a lot of patients have asymptomatic gallstones, and so there might be other pathology actually causing their symptoms. And then conversely, there is biliary pathology that exists without sonographic abnormality. Um, so if their symptoms fit and you still have clinical concern for biliary dysfunction, you may need to pursue further workup, maybe scintigraphy. So like all of ultrasound, it's a, again an operator-dependent skill, and there may be some challenges that you may face when you're trying to scan a gallbladder. Body habitus may be limiting. Some of our patients have an obesity problem, or they just have long rib cage or something that makes it more difficult. Our patients, we don't have the luxury of having them come in fasting, like the radiology suite, so that's going to make things more difficult because they've got bowel gas and a contracted gallbladder. And they're usually here because their stomach hurts, they're tender, and then you're going to go push a probe into it and maybe make things worse. Uh, a little bit of pain control can go a long way when you're doing this exam. And then other just challenges, you might run into the duodenum filled with gas nearby that looks like gallstones. All these challenges are things that can usually be overcome with a little bit of practice and improvement in your technique. So here is an example where we see uh, adjacent bowel mimicking the gallbladder. So you can see this here, this uh, fluid filled structure. It's got a black rim all the way around it. So that's one clue that it's bowel. Um, here we see a little bit of it right down in here. And then what we notice is we sweep a little bit more completely through this patient, evaluate them more completely. We start to see gallbladder right up in here. And then we see it again right here. Uh, so using some of our other landmarks like portal vein, main lobar fissure, paddock parenchyma, and just by doing a full evaluation with big sweeps in the area, we can definitely identify gallbladder and avoid some of these mimics. So here's a clinical algorithm we put together that uh, 
you find useful. So first, you got the patient in front of you. You suspect maybe cholecystitis is going on. So you're right there at the bedside. Do your ultrasound. So you start right here. And if that's normal, you get a good scan and there's nothing going on, then cholecystitis is pretty unlikely. So you've got to decide, am I going to continue to pursue this or do I need to look elsewhere, bark up another tree? Then next, maybe you see just stones in the gallbladder. So then you got to decide how sick are they, how do their labs look. If they're looking pretty good, their symptoms improve, they can take PO, they've got normal labs, then they're probably okay to do an outpatient surgery referral. And then maybe if their symptoms continue, they can have an elective cholecystectomy. On the other hand, say they're still sick, they're still vomiting, or their liver enzymes are abnormal, their bilirubin's up, then they may need to go on to some further imaging, maybe just have a surgical evaluation in the emergency department, and they may need admission. And then same thing on the other extreme, you do the ultrasound, They've got multiple signs. They've got stones, they're tender, they've got fluid around their gallbladder. You can jump right into maybe further diagnostic imaging or just a surgical evaluation and probably admission in the emergency department. So just to summarize, uh, emergency ultrasound of the biliary tract is incredibly helpful. It's fast, it's accurate, can help you narrow your differential, make a diagnosis right at the bedside, or pursue other diagnoses if it's looking negative. Always make sure you look for your normal landmarks, do a complete exam of the uh, fundus, the body, and the neck, and as with all ultrasound, interpret everything in the wider clinical context. Here are some of the references. I'm not going to read them to you. I uh, hope this was useful and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thanks.